So once again, welcome everyone to the Sadhguru Center Speaker Series monthly events. It's wonderful to have people joining us from around the world. And we're really happy to welcome you to our monthly virtual lectures and discussions highlighting the research and explorations of our multidisciplinary community of scientists, global experts, and thought leaders. My name is Tulsi Chase, and I'm the head of education and outreach for the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. And I see already in the chat, we have members of our community joining us from across the United States, from Portugal and the UK. Welcome everyone, so nice to have you all. So for those of you who are joining this event with us for the first time, uh, I wanted to share a little bit more about our center with you. So Sadhguru Center is a multidisciplinary research center based at the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which as many of you know, is a Harvard teaching hospital. Our aim is really to bring tools of well-being to both patients and healthcare providers to enhance consciousness, cognition, and compassion. So our work really happens at the nexus of research, education, and outreach. We offer wellness programs, we conduct scientific studies in various communities, and we bring together world leaders from diverse fields to collaborate and innovate health and well-being solutions. And you can learn more about our center with the link shared with you in the chat. So today we have a very special speaker with us talking on the topic of personalized medicine, the Ayurveda way, and introducing our speaker is the director of our center, Dr. Balachandar Subramaniam. Thank you, Tulsi. Welcome everyone. And I'm sure more people are gonna join in a few minutes. It's my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Archana Purushottam. She's a vascular neurologist and clinical researcher at the Baylor College of uh, Medicine, Houston, United States. She's also affiliated to the Michael E. DeBecky VA Medical Center, where she directs the Headache Center for Excellence and treats patients using integrative medicine, including elements of yoga and Ayurvedic nutrition and lifestyle counseling. She holds an MBBS from JIPMER and uh, she's just a year behind me. And so we are very proud of uh, her. And she also holds an MTech and PhD in biomedical engineering from one of the uh, IATs, uh, IAT Mumbai and the University of Minnesota respectively. She trained in neurology uh, at the University of Arizona and sub-specialized sub in vascular neurology at Stanford University. Her early research focused on neuroimaging, including functional MRI. Um, more recently, she has done research on treatment and acute stroke with Ayurveda and uh, Ayurvedic Prakriti. Welcome, Archana. Thank you very much, Bala. And uh, it's a real honor to be um, speaking to you all uh, at the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. I'm gonna start with a little bit of uh, um, a, a little audience quiz. So, um, you know the topic, so that's that's already a clue. But can you identify who you? I'm not going to ask for the for the lady in there, but do you know who the person is on the right? Um, and feel you know, just put it into the chat, maybe. Yep, that's right. We we have several replies, and. Uh, I, you know, Deepak Chopra, um, a lot of the medicine he does is um, based on Ayurveda. A lot of the, you know, wellness concepts are all uh, Ayurveda based. Okay, let me move on. Um, do you recognize what this is? And of course, it, it has to be related somehow to today's uh, topic. So these are copper plated surfaces on um, you know on a on an operating room because copper is uh, you know uh, it inhibits uh, growth of uh, bacteria it is actually um, uh, microbicidal and this is a concept from Ayurveda where um, traditionally water drinking water was kept in copper pots uh, copper or silver uh, if you could afford it because that um, uh, in, in some way sterilizes the water. Okay, and 
I'm sure you're all familiar with this person and you must have heard of the connection to Ayurveda. Feel free to, uh, you know, type in um, if you'd be, um, if, you know, it would be more interactive if you would. Um, do you know what his, his connection is with today's talk? Okay. I'm, I'm just going to go on. This is Aaron Rodgers. He underwent Panchakarma and that really brought um, Panchakarma into the news recently um, and some talk about Ayurveda. Um, and really quickly, a few other things that are very common here that all um, are related to Ayurveda. Turmeric latte, this is a very classic um, Ayurvedic medication, medi medicinal food. Um, for uh, uh, colds and viral infections that's used even today um, quite widely in India. Um, and then here is Aveda, that is the uh, company you might have heard of. It's a cosmetic company, which was then um, bought by ST Lauder, I believe. Um, Aveda was based on Ayurvedic um, medications for, or, uh, you know, applications um, that are used on the skin to improve um, beauty and uh, the complexion. And finally, probiotics, which are very popular here. This is, again, a very um, old Ayurvedic um, uh, use. So uh, this is used a lot, for instance, for gut uh, problems, as well as several other problems. Uh, it, is it is recommended to um, have yogurt uh, in a specific form, actually in a buttermilk form by Ayurveda for, for many conditions. And that is now quite popular here as well. So just a, a little glimpse of how Ayurveda, you actually come across a lot of Ayurvedic uh, principles and ideas being used. Uh, although many people may not have actually heard of Ayurveda, the term itself. All right, so what is Ayurveda? Ayurveda, the term comes from two words in Sanskrit. One is Ayu, which means life or longevity. And the other is Veda, meaning science or sacred knowledge. Now that's kind of uh, uh, redundant because uh, in, in, the, in the Indian tradition, um, all knowledge is considered sacred. So really it means knowledge. Um, and so Ayurveda basically means uh, the science of longevity. Um, and this extends not only, uh, this is not only based, um, you know, used for human medicine and wellness, but it extends to veterinary medicine and also includes an extensive knowledge of botany. So um, it is a, it's a very well-developed science. It is very integrated into the daily living of people um, from that part of the country who, are, who still follow traditional practices. So uh, for instance, a lot of Indian recipes are based on Ayurvedic principles of balancing out um, you know, various factors that influence health to create a, a, a wholesome kind of food. So let me move on to tell, talk a little bit about uh, you know, Ayurveda in the context of the history of complementary and alternative medicine um, and wellness therapies. So um, Ayurveda and yoga uh, date back to approximately, they're believed to date back to approximately 3000 years uh, before the Christian era. Um, they were initially, this was oral and practicing uh, tradition and then uh, around 1200 BCE, uh, there are actually written records. It became codified. There are textbooks that start appearing from around that point. Then you can see traditional Chinese medicine dates back. Uh, it's thought to about 2000 before Christ, uh, BCE, and then ancient Greek medicine about 500 BCE, uh, and so on. So the the concept of food is medicine, um, which uh, appeared, uh, which appears here at the bottom, that is embodied in Ayurveda, as I was mentioning, you know, turmeric latte, for instance, that's, that's really food, but it is used very um, widely as medicine. 
Yeah, I see that there was there's somebody who mentions Vruksha, Vruksha Ayurveda, which means tree or plant Ayurveda. Absolutely right. That's what I was talking about. You know, it was used to treat, um, you know, he, uh, animals. It was also used for plants. So the principles of Ayurveda essentially are believed to apply or are used, uh, applied to all life. So one of the key factors, the early, uh, sorry, key figures, one of the earliest figures um, well known in the history of Ayurveda is Charaka. The term also refers to a wandering scholar or a physician. He had, he made, a, he wrote a very extensive book, which is still used as a major textbook even today, uh, the Charaka Samhita. This dates back to, um, perhaps a few centuries uh, BCE. And it has a lot of very interesting um, uh, uh, concepts that are used, which uh, we know today, but um, seem to be really, uh, for his times, very advanced. So some of these are health and disease are not predetermined and life may be prolonged by human effort and attention to lifestyle. So lifestyle is heavily emphasized in all of Ayurveda. And he explicitly said that. Um, and therefore prevention has a much more prominent place than treatment in Ayurveda and in Charaka's philosophy. And this includes restructuring one's lifestyle to align with the course of nature and the seasons. And they actually used the term wellness. It's a more recent concept in Western medicine, uh, the, you know, taking the focus away from treating disease to actually promoting wellness. Uh, they did a lot of wellness promotion as uh, uh, their major um, goal in Ayurveda. Sushruta was another very, um, very uh, uh, prominent physician in the history of Ayurveda. He dates back about 2,600 years. He's considered the father of surgery and ophthalmology. This picture here is really an artist's uh, imagination of what it must have been like. So there may be factual errors that we are not aware of, but this is how the artist imagined it based on whatever written records are there. So Sushruta is known to have um, done plastic surgery. So he used cartilage from the ear to repair the nose of patients in whom leprosy had caused um, you know, the nose to get deformed. Similarly, he used to also do cataract surgeries. And there is a, not only a record, but there are existing instruments that are described and continue to be used um, for you know, hundreds of years uh, afterwards that one can see even today. Ayurveda has many branches um, and yoga, which is a lot more popular uh, in the West is uh, essentially uh, is like a sister science to Ayurveda, which is not as well known. Um, Ayurveda has eight branches, just like modern medicine has several branches. Uh, interestingly, spiritual healing or psychology also finds a mention there and so does health and longevity. And another very interesting um, organ of Ayurveda is purification of the genetic organs or, you know, some sort of uh, genetics and genetic therapies to overcome, um, I'm sorry, therapies to overcome um, genetic um, uh, afflictions. So let's get to what the basic principles of Ayurveda are. So, you know, the cosmos is, uh, theorized to be, be made up of five great elements, which are space, air, fire, water, and earth. And these combine, you can see um, these, these kapha, pitta, and vata, these are the names of the three doshas, and they are formed by combinations of these elements. So you can see them placed in the right place. Fire and water combine to form pitta, the air and ether combine to form vata, and the earth and water again combined to form kapha. So from the five elements, we now reduce this complexity to three, vata, pitta, and kapha. And all of Ayurveda is essentially based on this 
three doshic principles, so the three doshas. And what are these? So vata is the subtle energy or dosha that is associated with movement. Pitta represents all the metabolic processes. Kapha represents the body structure and lubrication. So here is, I'm sorry, this chat window is, um, okay, here we go. So this is now the Vata, Pitta, Kapha uh, sort of triangle at the center of which the human system sits. And as I mentioned before, this is, this um, Vata, Pitta and Kapha are the three basic um, energies or processes that are required for all life. So whether you're, talking about a plant or whether you're talking about an animal or whether we're talking about ourselves, all of us have certain compositions or certain proportions of vata, pitta, and kapha um, within us. So that is uh, essentially the basis of the theory that would help us understand Ayurveda. So here is a, a nice uh, cartoon description of how um, this works. So what is constitution or prakriti in Ayurveda? It is basically the combination of the three doshas, kapha, pitta, and vata that we are born with. So you can, you can say this person may have been born with a smaller amount of kapha, sort of a moderate pitta, and a high vata component. Now, in this particular um, diagram, they're trying to represent a vata imbalance, which is why there is spilling of the water outside. But essentially, it is the relative proportions of the kapha, pitta, and vata that form ones that tell us about one's prakriti or constitution. So everybody is born with a unique combination of these, and that is... The rep that represents that person's state of health. Any deviation from this state of health leads to disease. That's the fundamental understanding of health and disease in terms of the dosha prakriti. So let's go um, and look a little more into, into this balance versus imbalance. So from health to disease, it's a, it's a spectrum of you know, complete balance, complete imbalance and various states in between. Um, there is constant interaction between order and disorder in the body. And to maintain balance, the body, mind and consciousness work together. Health is of course order. And then how, how do you go once you've, you've um, acquired an imbalance, how do you get it rebalanced again? So what you do is you understand the nature of the disorder. That is what the Ayurvedic diagnosis in, involves. And then you work on reestablishing that order by various interventions, which may be lifestyle interventions, or it may be specific medications or therapies. Let's look at the definitions of health. So um, in the West, in the, the earliest that I could find was from the fifth century BC, um, Pindar defined health as harmonious functioning of the organs. Plato uh, defined it as a healthy mind in a healthy body. And this included the not only the physical, but also the social environment. The World Health Organization in 1948 uh, defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this definition of um, health come from Ayurveda, comes from Sushruta. As I mentioned, this is probably about uh, 2,500, 2,600 years old. Um, it's defined in, in, in this Sanskrit uh, verse, which says, sama dosha sama agnishcha, sama dhatu mala kriyaha, Prasannatma indriya manaha swastha iti abhidhiyate, which means the energies, which represents the vata, pitta, and kapha, that they are in a state of balance. The agni essentially means the fire, and this represents to the metabolism. So the enzymes and the metabolism are working properly. 
the tissues should be actively engaged in nutritive uh, process. Waste products should be eliminated naturally from the body and the consciousness, sense organs and the mind should be in a pleasant state. This is the definition of health in Ayurveda. It's a very broad, all encompassing uh, definition. Now, what does Ayurveda aim to do? So Ayurveda again states that its goal is swasthasya swas, sorry, swasthasya swasthya rakshana, which means protecting the health of the healthy people. And aturasya vikara prashamanam, which is to cure diseases that develop in the body. So in effect, curing diseases is a secondary aim. The first goal is to keep people healthy, which is prevention. And what are the, these signs of good health? How do you know somebody is swastha? Um, it, it is um, assessed by looking at multiple phenotypic factors. So appetite, good digestion with timely elimination of wastes. I apologize for the spelling error. Um, lightness of the body, a pleasant state of the senses, the ability to sleep soundly, good strength, vitality and vigor, good complexion, and a pleasant and calm state of mind. So all of these uh, together tell you the person is in good health. Now, let us um, talk about why is it important to look at these doshas? Why is it important to look at these signs? Um, so Ayurveda believes in um, a disease progression. So how do you go from health to disease? So there are st six stages of pathogenesis of disease in Ayurveda. The first three states that they describe, interestingly, are the asymptomatic states, stages. So Ayurveda actually talks about how initial imbalance is described in, in, in you know, detail in Ayurvedic texts. These early stages of imbalance do not cause any symptoms um, of dysfunction. But if you look for them, you, uh, you know, either by observation or by actual examination, you may be able to find them. And then it starts, once it crosses these three stages, it then starts manifesting as the actual disease. So if you compare that with modern medicine, we have the pre-symptomatic stage, the prodrome, and then the full manifestation of disease. So the pre-symptomatic stage would correspond to these first three uh, stages that Ayurveda talks about. Now, how do you treat, um, you know, restore balance? You use multiple interventions. Um, let me just take a look at the time. I think um, I'm going to skip a couple of these slides because um, I'm concerned we'll run out of time. So there are many things you use to create balance, food, lifestyle, um, yoga, breathing exercises, medicines, etc. Let's come back to this um, very interesting uh, uh, cartoon because it has a few more things that I would like to emphasize that would be useful going forward. Now, keep in mind that the amount of kapha represented here does not necessarily mean this patient, this person has a disease at all. If this is the, it does not matter how much, if that is the amount you were born with, that is still normal. It is your state of health, as long as that can be maintained. It is when you have a, a vitiation or an aggravation of that dosha that you call, that you get disease. So once again, just to emphasize, everybody has some amount of kapha, pitta, or vata. Without that, life is not possible. So these all three glasses have some amount of the dosha in them. So now, let us ha having emphasized that, let me move on to this description of how prakriti or constitution is. Uh, typically classified. So when prakriti assessment is done, people who have very predominant kapha characteristics, 
Now, I did not talk about this so far, and I will get to it, but every dosha is associated with certain characteristics. For instance, vata is associated with dryness. Kapha is associated with moistness. So using multiple of these characteristics, these phenotypic characteristics, people can be classified into predominantly kapha, predominantly pitta, or predominantly vata types, or which is more common actually, even though in this, in this image, the area in pitta, vata, and kapha are larger than these intersecting areas. In reality, the pure pitta, kapha, or vata people are rarer. The most common are the mixed types. So pitta, kapha, vata, pitta, vata, kapha, and then you have the tridoshic type where you have in more or less equal uh, proportions of all three doshas. Coming to now the different gunas. So each of these three doshas has different characteristics associated with it. These are Sanskrit names, but just to give an example. So um, I had already talk to you about ruksha, which is dryness. Shita means cold. On the other hand, for pitta, you have ushna, which is warm. And you have, let's see, um, chala, which is very active. You know, chala represents movement, so something which moves a lot. Um, same way you might have, um, let me see, manda in kapha, which means slow. Um, and so on. So you different features, uh, different um, characteristics that can be um, assessed using, uh, you know, either mental or physical characteristics. So, for instance, somebody who who speaks very fast, who replies, who is quick to reply, that would be a characteristic of vata. People who speak slowly, who think and consider their replies. Um, when asked anything, that is a that is one feature of kapha. Now there are many, many, many such characteristics or uh, ways to identify which dosha um, you know is present or which is predominant. So keep in mind, just because a person speaks slowly or speaks fast, that's not enough to make that decision. You have to look at multiple systems, you look at the physical as well as, well as the mental characteristics. Now, people who know um, Ayurveda and learn Ayurveda tend to think of everything in terms of vata, pitta, and kapha. Uh, so this is just, uh, I found this really funny about how they've classified shoppers into vata, pitta, and kapha. So you can really um, use the vata, pitta, kapha classification for anything and everything. So, you know, here's the what they think would be the difference between a vata, pitta, and kapha person. Kapha always careful, a lot of very patient, vata quick to decide, uh, pitta generally very focused, very goal-directed and oriented. So these are the some of the mental um, and uh, um, psychological personality features of these doshas. Now, let's come to the um, what biological evidence is there to uh, support this classification based on the three doshas. Uh, are there any biological cor correlates? So lately, in, in recent years, I'm sorry, I'm seeing these blue streaks appear on my screen. I'm not sure what they are. Um, but in, in the last perhaps 25 years or so, there's been a lot of research into the biological basis of Prakriti and the three dosha classification. This is a report on a genome-wide analysis where they looked at nucleotides at 52 in, in all over the human genome and looked at whether these were different between vata predominant, kapha predominant, and pitta predominant groups of people. And what they found was 
nucleotides at 52 loci in the human genome were significantly different between the prakritis. A principal component analysis of these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms was able to classify 262 individuals into their respective vata, pitta, or kapha type groups, irrespective of their genetic ancestry. So that is the important thing. So this was true across, um, you know, it was not just one um, endogamous or one genotypically similar group. Um, this finding was validated with uh, several population samples from India with known ancestry, and they also found there was a specific um, uh, locus, a specific nucleotide, which correlated also with the phenotype of Pitta. So there seems to be a genetic um, correlate to Prakriti. Now, let's look at something else, which is DNA methylation. Essentially, this is epigenetics. This is, um, they looked at methylation signatures, again, in three distinct groups of people with these Prakriti phenotypes. And what they found was that Ayurvedic Prakriti classification appeared to have, um, you know, a definite DNA methylation correlation as well. So it has both genetic and epigenetic correlates. I'm only presenting here a, a very a selected subset of the extensive research um, documenting, you know, ge genomic, uh, metabolomic, um, hematological, uh, various kinds of differences between uh, the three doshas. Here is another one, which is related to the EGLN1 uh, gene. So this is a, a gene where uh, these two common variations, there are common variations at these two sites, at these two, um, you know, um, yeah, sites on this gene. And the TT genotype at this site is more frequent at the first site is more frequent in kapha and lesser in pitta individuals. This correlates not only with higher expression of this gene, but it has an actual um, translation into clinical relevance. So high altitude pulmonary edema affects some people when they climb to high altitudes. And this is correlated with, with this particular genotype, TT genotype here. And it's this genotype is nearly absent in natives of high altitude for, I guess, obvious reasons, uh, if they should survive at such altitudes. Now, in this study, they also looked at uh, data from some consortium. Um, this is the human genome, um, I forget, I think Genetic Dispar Disparities Project. Um, and they were looking at, um, you know, in different, global populations with, um, with different genetic, uh, you know, uh, of different genetic stock. They were looking at whether this allele T was present. And they did find that at high altitudes, irrespective of the different genetic lineages, they tended to share the same ancestral allele of this, the second one. And that, positively correlated as you went, as these uh, populations came from higher altitudes, they tended to have a higher incidence of this allele. And that is overrepresented in Pitta. Now, just to mention again, as I told you earlier, Pitta is correlated with heat, with being able to generate more heat. So you would see the obvious um, relationship with living at a high altitude. So people who tend to live there would have to have a higher ability to generate heat. So there is, a, you know, that, that characteristic also indicates that that's likely to be, a, you know, you're likely to have more Pitta people there, but it's interesting to see the genetic correlation as well. Here's another one, you know, talking about how Prakriti is related to HLA types. So for instance, in this study, they found a complete uh, absence of a certain allele, HLA allele in vata, and a, and a complete absence of a different HLA allele in kapha. 
um, subject. And then there were some differences in the allele frequency for some other HLA type. Now, we know that HLA types are related to immunity. They're also related um, to through their um, you know, immune, um, correlated, immune um, uh, implications or immune expression perhaps are also related to certain autoimmune diseases. Um, and so you can see that this also could have a bearing on susceptibility to certain diseases, as well as response to certain medications, because that also correlates in some cases with HLA typing. Here's a plasma metabolomic study. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but basically the Prakriti types differed predominantly in steroidal hormone biosynthesis, amino acid, and arachidominic acid metabolism uh, pathways. So, um, and now the, the gut microbiome has gained a lot of importance uh, in the last maybe decade or so. And they there are several groups that have looked at how gut microbiota um, correlate with Prakriti. And they have also found that they have enrichment of specific bacteria um, in the different Prakriti groups. Even when in a population you have an overall similar, um, you know, diversity of flora, but the certain bacteria tend to be represented more depending on which Prakriti group they belong to. So now we've already um, seen quite a bit of evidence. I did not talk about, you know, studies that have looked at, as I mentioned earlier, hematological parameters and uh, um, other uh, biochemical blood parameters, et cetera. Um, but suffice it to say that Prakriti does appear to have a very strong biologic correlate um, starting from the gene level. So if you look at the epidemiologic triad of Western medicine, we have the agent that causes disease and then the environment, and then the host, they interact and it is the, the interaction that gives rise to disease. So you could look at Prakriti essentially as the host factor of the epidemiologic triad. And therefore that would imply that Prakriti should influence susceptibility to disease. And this is what Ayurveda says. Um, the, the Charaka Samhita, Sushruta Samhita, um, and some of the very author authoritative textbooks of Ayurveda actually detail for every Prakriti what kinds of diseases they are very likely to have, what they're more susceptible to. So let us see if there's any um, modern evidence to show that. So this is a study where they looked at rheumatoid arthritis. They looked at 21 markers from inflammatory and oxidative stress pathways that are implicated in development of rheumatoid arthritis. So they looked at 325 cases and 356 controls. Each of these was divided into the three Vata, Pitta and Kapha subgroups. And we, um, they found that in the Vata subgroup, the genes that were more involved in development of the disease tended to be the inflammatory genes such as these. In Pitta and Kapha, they found more um, a, a, a greater representation of oxidative stress pathway genes that were involved. So even within the same disease, there is a heterogeneity of the pathway, um, actual molecular or biochemical pathway for pathogenesis um, that is emphasized or that is involved more in different um, Prakriti subgroups. They also looked at severity of disease and that was most pronounced in Vata. Now, um, Vata is implicated with various kinds of arthritis. So as I told you, Ayurvedic textbooks talk about which, um, which Prakritis are susceptible to which kinds of diseases and arthritis are um, a Vata related disorder. So this was interesting. It confirms what the Ayurvedic textbooks say. So now given that we uh, did this study where we were interested 
to find out if Prakriti is a risk factor for stroke. We actually developed and validated a Prakriti questionnaire based on the Charaka Samhita for the study um, because, and I'll explain to you why, because we actually did a quantitative instead of a qualitative analysis, which is what typically had been done till then. So we did a case control um, study. Uh, the cases were adult in and out patients diagnosed with stroke recruited from three hospitals, we had 166, and then the controls were caregivers as well as bystanders in these hospitals. We had 136 of those. We recorded their stroke history and we administered a Prakriti questionnaire to all of them. And as I mentioned, so instead of binning people into you're a predominant vata, you're a predominant kapha, and you're a predominant um, um, pitta, what we did was we measured the strokes as I, mentioned earlier, everybody has a certain level of vata, pitta, and kapha. So we measured the scores for vata, pitta, and kapha for each, um, each person. And we used these numbers to do an analysis. And here is what we found. Let me explain what this graph actually um, represents. So here we have the score, right? So the, the vata, pitta, or kapha score is represented on the x-axis. The y-axis tells you the frequency of this among our population. So how many people had that score? The gray curve represents the control and the blue, the stroke group. What we found was the Kafa scores of the stroke subgroup was less significantly than the, that of the control. The Pitta scores were higher in the stroke subgroup than that of the control the Vata scores did not significantly differ. Now this again is curious because this, the stroke, uh, sorry, the Ayurvedic textbooks talk about stroke as being a Vata Vyadi. So it's related to exacerbation of Vata. We found no difference in Vata. On the other hand, um, a lot of Kapha in, according to the Ayurvedic textbooks too, uh, a lot of Kapha, can counteract vata. So it's interesting that we did not find a difference in vata, but we did find a decrease in the kapha for our stroke patients, almost as if they had less of an ability to prevent this um, than the controlled population did. We next did, a, uh, we created a multiple logistic regression model for stroke risk because we were trying to see we already know several things that increase stroke risk. So for instance, we know hypertension, uh, smoking, diabetes, we know all of these increased stroke risk. So there are stroke risk models that have been developed using these factors. And the question was, will, cuff, will knowing Prakriti add to such a stroke model at all? And what we found when we included all of these and looked for significance was that the stroke risk model we got um, from taking away all the factors that did, were not significantly contributing, we were left with these um, five factors. So in even when we knew about hypertension, even though we had included information on gender, alcohol intake, kapha and pitta values also added to that model. So they, they, they added some information. They were not as strongly significant as hypertension and alcohol intake, but I'm sorry, not alcohol intake, but hypertension, but they were about as, as much, they added as much as um, alcohol intake did to that model. So our results showed that stroke patients, both ischemic and hemorrhagic had significantly lower and higher pitta scores, which I told you about. Um, this was the odds ratio of kapha dominance and stroke of pitta dominance, the odds ratio was this. And Prakriti does appear to be a risk factor for several vascular disease um, as Ayurveda predicts. And finally, I'm just gonna uh, talk about this uh, briefly about this um, small study, but interesting where they looked at cancer patients and whether um, they're, they, again, they did a case control study. They had cancer patients um, on one side where they did a Prakriti analysis, and on the other side, they had the controls for whom they also did a Prakriti analysis. 
In this case, they divided them into the, you know, vata, pitta, vata, kapha, pitta, kapha, pitta, vata. So they did the, um, the overlapping uh, kind of um, um, dual prakriti classification. And the interesting thing you can see is that the majority of the cancer patients, they fell into the pitta category. Um, whereas in the normals, you see that there are several, that is not true. They are divided among all the categories. Uh, of course, this was a small study. It wasn't very well balanced even among the controls, but you can see the difference between the two. And this suggests that you know, further uh, study is, uh, might be interesting. So we actually went ahead and did a study on, just like we did on stroke, on cancer patients as well. That is something that we have not fully analyzed, but our preliminary results are very interesting and do seem to support this, that cancer patients have a higher pitta than um, controlled patients, I'm sorry, controlled subjects. So here's, here's another example of how I think we're um, getting to, um, to sort of the time that I was asked to finish in. I'll just try to finish up in a couple of minutes. Um, here's a study where they looked at platelet, platelet aggregation and found that platelet aggregation was higher among vata, pitta, prakriti individuals. They also responded better to low-dose aspirin than others. Again, um, here's a, a suggestion that therapy might be guided in some cases by knowing their prakriti um, if we know what effects, how, they res how different prakritis respond to different therapies. And I'm gonna finish up um, with this uh, study, this other study of ours, just to give you an example of how, uh, you know, knowing the, these doshas helps tailor and personalize treatment in Ayurveda. So this was a study that we did of standalone Ayurvedic treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Uh, it was a prospective and observational study. Um, and I'm not going to go into further details of the study, but this was the Ayurvedic treatment protocol, and that's why I brought it up. So the first, um, first treatment, so the, the physician would assess what doshas were, were vitiated, were affected the most uh, for a particular patient. So for instance, how would they distinguish this? So a patient who had um, complete loss of sensation, complete numbness, that points to kapha being involved. On the other hand, if the patient had a lot of burning, um, so you know that's also a sensory disturbance, but it's a different kind of sensory disturbance. Now in, in Western medicine, we do not distinguish between those two as much. We just say, you know, it's, it's the sensory systems affected, but they would call that, if it's burning, they would call that pitta. Um, similarly, various features. So, you know, when somebody's unable to move, um, if it feels, they complain of it feeling particularly heavy, that the limb is heavy, that's taken as a sign of um, kapha. Uh, so they have different ways to assess this, but based on that, they would, Typically, uh, pitta tends to be affected in a lot of these patients. So they do start with some pitta treatments. So this is meant to bring the pitta down to normal. And then they would assess every day, they would assess these various characteristics um, and decide whether the pitta had been adequately treated. And for different patients, this would occur on different days. Once that happened, they would switch to the next step of their treatment. And every, at every step, they would assess which dosha was, you know, had what its current state was. So from the prakriti, which is a fixed um, proportion, we come to, in disease states, assessment of the abnormal um, prakriti levels. And then they, they look at that and then tailor the treatment appropriately. And so different patients would get a different, slightly different versions of this overall common workflow protocol. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge um, those who were involved in some of the studies I presented, um, my graduate students and fellows who actually did a lot of the, 
the work involved, and then collaborators from different uh, institutions. So Dr. Aaron from CMC Vellor, Dr. Parvaje, uh, who was our Ayurveda expert for the stroke study from Puthur and Dr. Rajesh um, from People Tree Hospital for the stroke case control study. Thank you all, and I'm happy to take questions. Ashna, that is fascinating uh, presentation. Um, Thank you. I think I see a lot of uh, questions in the chat. A lot of people are interested. Uh, I was going to ask you that, you know, um, a few centuries ago, whenever this started, it is uh, kind of nice to know these uh, prakriti and constitutions and go with it. But now, has it been improved uh, by all the things that we know with all these, you know, confounders and various disease models, etc.? So the question is, why do we have to just stick to just these three basic uh, constitutions? I think you partly answered it uh, in your uh, regression model, but I just wanted to hear from you. Yeah. So um, prakriti is so there. There are two um, two advantages to this. So one is, as in that stroke uh, risk model, it may actually give us more information than we have from our current, um, current commonly used methods. So for instance, we are not able to do metabolomic analysis. So as we saw in that arthritis study, you know, to actually go in and identify for each patient which genes are upregulated and which um, you know, pathways are up, you know, currently um, uh, upregulated to actually treat those. So knowing the prakriti may actually give us additional information. And the, the really obvious thing is also that there is um, a huge, um, you know, uh, sustainability of medicine is a big thing, right? How much can we afford? Uh, can we do this for every person? Uh, we really have difficulty even uh, getting sort of a basic level of care to um, people all over the world and forget all over the world, even, even in the United States, there, there's so much of disparity. So once some of these are validated, they may actually provide us a very easy way to identify what are the you know therapies that would be most likely to benefit certain subgroups of patients? Right. So I, I guess this the delivery of this is more important than uh, properly trained physicians and trying to do it correctly. I think somebody was actually asking in the chat. There are so many questions in the chat, so why don't I go through um, some of them at least? So. Okay. Dr. Adi from UK, she's asking, can you explain using metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, diabetes mellitus 2 as a clinical example, please, for constitution types? Okay, yeah, so the typically um, the metabolic syndrome is most um, common among the kapha prakriti. So kapha predominant people tend to develop the metabolic syndrome. Um, now, end organ damages are not solely kapha related. They are also related to other um, doshas getting involved. So do keep in mind that it's not always just one, one of the doshas that is affected, that is causing the disease. There could be affliction of multiple doshas at the same time, uh, which makes treatment more challenging actually. Um, and also, this also gives this example also gives a good um, um, good um, sorry this this question also gives a good, gives us a good example for the pathogenesis. So as you saw, there were three stages that were preclinical, and then there were three stages where there are. Um, I guess I could bring it back, but that would take some time. Uh, that slide, but there are three stages that are after you know manifestation of symptoms. So some of these end organ damage that you're talking about, that would be the last, um, last in the six steps of pathogenesis. This is where they talk of tissue destruction. So where you have end organ damage, whereas the preclinical stages would be, for instance, the asymptomatic hyperglycemia. Um, and, and then, you know, as you start developing symptoms, you know, more frequent 
um, polyuria, polydipsia, um, and sometimes either, uh, you know, depending on the kind of um, uh, diabetes, you may have different other symptoms associated with it. So that would be stages number four, and then going into five, and then stage six would be the end organ damage. If, you know, if there's anything else that you were um, asking about, please let me know. I hope I've answered that. Yeah, so there's there's a question about uh, oh that was that is from um, Yobala, immigration and transplantation of humans from one climate to another at least in the first generation will be susceptible to diseases intuitively. Can this be explained by Ayurveda? Absolutely. So uh, Ayurveda, you know, um, gives a lot of importance to the the location and the climate of the place. So if you migrate from one climate to another, the balance your your inherent balance that you have, um, your prakriti has established with that climate is now um, no longer, um, it, it's no longer, um, you know, uh, can the same balance is now broken. It's, it's an, uh, you have to re restore or have a fresh process of reacclimatization to the new, to the new place. Now, sometimes that may be relatively easy, but in some cases that may, um, actually lead to disease. So for the worst um, or the, a very dramatic example of this is high altitude pulmonary edema, but lesser uh, problems. So for instance, moving to a very dry climate, um, people, especially if you have a vata prakriti, you might actually develop a lot of problems with your skin. Uh, or even if you have a pitta prakriti, you could develop uh, skin problems. Kapha people tend to deal well with dryness so they might not be affected as much and so on. So um, that's, that's how Ayurveda explains it. How to get to a balanced body to minimize risk of diseases. So yeah, the, so the interesting thing about diet and, and all of these is so therefore Ayurveda doesn't believe that there is any one diet that's healthy for everyone. So this is very much at variance with are, uh, you know, how we often learn nutrition, you know, in terms of, um, you know, eat, eat healthy, eat vegetables, eat fresh food, eat unprocessed food. Yes, to some extent, those principles are true across the board for everyone. But then when you actually start going into what vegetables should you eat, what grains should you eat, how much fat should you eat? So again, for instance, the cut down fats is not is not at all um, something that's in tune with Ayurvedic prescription. So people who have a vata uh, constitution require quite a bit of fat to be healthy. Um, people who have a kapha constitution, they don't need much fat. They need to watch their fat. Pitta people need certain kind of fat can be beneficial for them. So it's, you know, all, all the prescriptions. So same thing with exercise, right? So. And same with fasting. And this is something I see a lot um, among patients because a lot of them have taken now to the, to the you know, fasting. Intermittent fasting is a big thing. Ayurveda does not recommend fasting for everybody. Nothing is good for everybody. So fasting also should be very um, tailored to your specific prakriti. If you're a vata person, you are not going to do well with fasting, even though you may be able to, you're actually going to hurt your body in the long run, unless you do some very sort of specific kinds of fasting are allowed, um, are prescribed, but not uh, an overall, I, I'm not going to eat anything for 16 hours every day or 12 hours every day. This is, this is what I often see. And I actually see patients who have been doing this and don't realize that that might have led to their the worsening of their health problem that they come in with. Um, same with uh, exercise. Again, exercise is, you know, there's a certain amount of exercise is good for everybody, but very vigorous excessive exercise is not recommended for, you know, certain prakriti types. So again, all, all these prescriptions are specific to your prakriti type. Um, yes, um, right. That's a very good question. There are so many folks offering Ayurvedic services to improve health. How do you know what is genuine and what isn't? 
um, yeah, um, you know, there are there are people. So in in those who actually go through Ayurvedic training in India, so you know, in Ayur, in India there are several Ayurvedic colleges. Just they have the same kind of study as Western medicine colleges. Just you know, Western medicine is a four and a half year um, study in India, and it's four and a half years for Ayurveda too. Uh, so people there they have a licensure process the same way, and so you know there is a certain quality control there. In the U.S., um, there is an effort uh, currently on in the Ayurvedic community to um, to bring about you know some certification mechanisms, and these uh, efforts are ongoing. So at this time, really, um, it it would have you know I don't have a definite way uh, to tell you. Uh, there are people who are trained in India who actually are licensed in India who are here practicing. So, you know, that that at least tells you they're licensed in, in, in one place um, in India. But, um, yeah, I think here, uh, once the certification mechanism comes in, um, you would have a way to help with that. Um, how do you? Yeah, especially with the medications. Yeah, I think the issue with medications really has been so there are some. Um, Ayurvedic uh, pharmacies or Ayurvedic uh, uh, laboratories that, that produce um, these medicines that are very well known, that have been around for a very long time, time tested. I mean, you know, they have, they have, uh, they're known for their quality in terms of Ayurvedic medicines. But again, I'm speaking for India where they have a process for testing these drugs, for, uh, you know, licensing these places. Um, here, again, that is not there. Uh, so people do get medications from India. There has been concern because um, they have looked at, uh, you know, there are publications that, um, you know, talk about how high um, lead levels, for instance, in some um, preparations and some Ayurvedic preparations. Um, some preparations are meant to contain some uh, metals. So they are used in Ayurveda therapeutically. However, there's a very, very complicated and specific process to how these metals should be used in these medications. So um, especially with these, it's important to know that you're, you're getting it from a, a reputed um, Ayurvedic um, medication manufacturing uh, you know, facility that has a reputation for doing it the right way, because if it's not done so, the same can be toxic. So it's really important to know if you're using a, a medication that you know has heavy metals as a component. It's really important to know that. But otherwise, uh, there is also the the issue of environmental contamination. So part of the concern may be also that there may be environmental contamination of the herbs that are being used for Ayurvedic preparation. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know that there is any um, very definite way. There are certain certain companies where they actually, um, that I know, but, um, you know, I, that where they look at these medications um, before using, you know, advanced methods like chromatography, et cetera, to make sure they're pure. So you would have to talk to an Ayurvedic practitioner to identify what the reputable companies are and then buy those. So um, I'm going to, uh, you know, summarize the rest of the questions in two or one. Hina Butt seems to be giving a lot of comments. Hina, you want to unmute and come on our video and uh, introduce yourself and uh, give your comments? Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. Um, thank you so much for uh, spreading uh, awareness about Ayurvedic medicine in in authentic way in, in its correct form. Uh, I really uh, appreciate your efforts there. You know, can you also tell about yourself? So interestingly, I'm an BAMS, uh, classically trained Ayurvedic doctor practicing here in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Great, thank you. Yeah, do you have any other comment on uh, what Ashna has been saying so far for the questions and Q&A sessions? Um, no, everything so far has been wonderful. I was just adding to 
um, her presentation that uh, based on the Prakriti, um, yes, there are uh, different types of Prakritis based on those three doshas, but each dosha also has five subtypes, which goes into much more detail uh, which I don't believe can be covered or explained in a one hour webinar. Um, that's why we study Prakriti for four and a half years, uh, practically. So thank you, Archana, for, for shedding the light uh, of the basic Prakriti evaluation and all those research studies going on. Um, I just wanted to add one information, which is uh, very new. Um, the uh, BMS graduates, which are the classically trained Ayurvedic practitioners from India um, who are practicing here in the United States, um, is forming a group uh, for credentialing and uh, certification of uh, Ayurvedic medicine doctors, which will be AMD. So soon um, we will definitely have uh, some credibility to the profession and then uh, consumers can safely uh, without any hesitation, reach out to that uh, organization for, oh, thank you so much for the applaud. I appreciate it. <laughs> so yes, consumer safety is the number one priority here. So uh, consumers will be able to reach out to the qualified professionals who, um, who will be able to guide them uh, when it comes to Ayurvedic medicine. And uh, they will not have to search for someone who is authentically classically trained uh, professionals. So uh, fingers crossed, it's, it's going on uh, very soon. You will, uh, yes, you will learn uh, something uh, definitely exciting uh, happening in the US. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just saw, looked at a question there. Shall I just quickly address that about whether body type changes during different times of the year or are we out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can uh, say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So body type doesn't change. The body type is fixed. That doesn't change. What happens is your body type, depending on your body type, you would react differently. Uh, so for instance, a pitta person might be most comfortable in winter. So they, they often will say, I can't tolerate heat. Whereas um, a vata or a kapha person might say, I really can't tolerate cold weather. So I like you know, I like it warm. So you may have different, uh, you know, different levels of comfort at different times of the year, depending on your constitution, but it doesn't change. Archana, so I'll ask one last question. Um, you know, you mentioned using questionnaires to come up with the classification. I know um, Ayurvedic doctors basically want to see the people and then classify them. How good are the questionnaires to classify these people as Vata, Pitta and Kapha? That's, that's a great question. So Ayurvedic doctors, they use a lot of uh, characteristics as well as they use actual exam, right? So observation and examination, they add all those in and some of them will use pulse as well to make this diagnosis. Um, now for research purposes, there has been some, um, you know, uh, some studies where they've compared how, how much correlation there is, you know, how um, different practitioners, their classification, if, if they all match. And there, there is differences. There are differences between doctors and how they classify. So that, that raises a, a challenge then for research, especially because you want to have something that's objective and you want to have something that can be reproduced. And in fact, this was the reason why we, we undertook a very long process of developing a fresh questionnaire um, you know, in, even though there were some questionnaires and some assessment methods that were available. Most of them were, you know, required an Ayurvedic physician uh, who was trained in certain kinds of uh, assessment and diagnosis. They were difficult to use for, uh, you know, for widely for research. And so that's why we came up with this. Um, since I have, uh, you know, used that for my study, I have actually shared it with other Ayurvedic practitioners who have used it in their studies and they seem to find it um, you know uh, useful to use in their research too so that's encouraging to me that uh, the, you know some of the Ayurvedic community themselves are um, are using this now yeah thank you so much again uh, I think Tulsi had something to share so Tulsi while you're coming up Lisa uh, Convoy can you come on screen and then ask your um, question directly to Archana. 
I think you had some comment there. Lisa? Thank you, Lisa, go ahead. Oh, my com I really mo mostly had a comment. Um, I'm really hoping that we can do more clinical work in this, in this, in this area. A lot of what we've done is prospective. Um, that's all. I just, I wanted to, I just wanted to put myself into the comment just to, I can follow up with you. There's really no, um, critique there at all. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you, Lisa. You know, I'll give your information to Archana and so you can get in touch with her. Uh, go ahead, Tulsi. Are you all able to see my slides? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Arjuna. What an in incredible presentation. And I know that it's only the tip of the iceberg of what Ayurveda really is and how deep it can go in, in understanding human health and well-being. And uh, we hope that we can continue to uh, learn more from you um, in the coming weeks and days. So um, if you all enjoyed this conversation, uh, please do join us next month for celebrating International Yoga Day, we are having with us Dr. Satbir Singh Khalsa, who is a renowned uh, researcher and is the director of yoga research for the Yoga Alliance and the Kundalini Research Institute, as well as an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he is going to be talking with us about yoga and the, the biomedical uh, science and research uh, around yoga. He's been conducting scientific yoga research since 2001 on yoga for insomnia, stress, anxiety disorders, and workplace and school settings, and is also a practitioner and instructor of Kundalini Yoga since 1973. So please do join us next month. And uh, just a little bit more about uh, other programs that we have going on right now. As many of you know, long COVID is uh, unfortunately taking the world by storm and is uh, in in sort of exacerbating the effects of this pandemic for many. And so in response, we, uh, as a center, decided to create something to support uh, our COVID long haulers. And we created a holistic uh, yoga and meditation program that supports not only their physical and respiratory health, but also their cognitive, neurological, and mental health. And so uh, there's a link in the chat where you can click to learn more about our long COVID uh, breathing and wellness program. We've had more than 350 patients already referred to this program and are supporting them uh, five days a week. And this program is designed with our center in partnership with the director of the, long, uh, the COVID survivorship program at our hospital. And then finally, please do stay connected with us on social media. This is one of the fastest and easiest ways to learn about our, all of our upcoming events, programs, and more. Uh, you can reach out to us at any time on Twitter and LinkedIn. And these links will also be shared in the chat with you. Uh, and finally, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we, you know, engaging with the community is what continues to keep us all learning and growing in our understanding of consciousness, cognition, and compassion. And we hope to stay connected. Archana, thank you so much again. And thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, it's fascinating that how you're bringing these two worlds together with rigorous science and research. And that is what we hope to do and connect with you. Thank you, Archana. Thank you, Bala. Thank you all. Namaskaram. Namaskaram.